So in order to understand the word of God, you have to be taught the word of God. You can't teach if you haven't been taught. Does that make a degree of sense? You cannot teach if you have not been taught. Well, we're going to talk tonight about the tradition of the elders. Now, some people may be thinking to yourself, some people may be saying, what in the world are the tradition of the elders? Now, before we get into the tradition of the elders, I want to make a few statements about tradition. One of the statements that I often hear today is people talking about tradition. It's not about tradition. It's about the word of God. It's not about tradition. It's about the scriptures. It's not about tradition. It's about the move of the Holy Spirit. It's not about tradition or it's not about religion. I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. And I know that these are very common statements that we make today. But I want to point some things out about this issue of tradition. There are actually in the scripture two types of tradition. And we're going to look we're going to look at this because we need to understand this as we move forward in the things of God. The first type of tradition that you will find in scripture is what I will refer to as God ordained tradition. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, the apostle Paul was writing to the church and he said, "Now I praise you because you have remembered everything I told you and you maintain the traditions just as I handed them on to you. Let me read that again. Now I praise you because you have remembered me in everything and you have kept the traditions. Now the King James says kept the ordinances. The word tradition in the Greek is the word paradosis. It's the, it, now, I'm not going to be getting into a lot of Greek, and I'm going to explain why. But the Greek word is paradosis, and what it literally means is an established practice and or belief. That's what tradition is. It is established practice and belief. Paul, in writing to the church of Corinth, says, I praise you because you've remembered me in everything and you maintain the traditions just as I handed them on to you. So writing to the church of Corinth, the church of Corinth had received the practices and the beliefs that Jesus left for his people. Those are what Paul is referring to when he says the traditions. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast. Now, I want you to keep that phrase in your mind. Hold fast to the traditions, to the established practices and beliefs that you were taught by us either by word of mouth or by our letter or our epistles. So what we have in the New Testament letters are <laughs> the practices and the teachings that Jesus gave to the 12, to the apostles, and also gave by revelation to the Apostle Paul. This becomes the foundation upon which the people of God are to rest their experience with the Lord Jesus. So Jesus didn't leave us to try to figure things out on our own. He actually sent the apostles 
to teach. So Jesus taught the apostles. The apostles taught the early church by word and by letter. That, that's what makes up the New Testament. So when we are reading the New Testament, we're literally reading what Jesus gave the apostolic fathers. Now, I'm, I'm using that term apostolic fathers to refer to the apostles. I'm not using it to refer to the second and third generation Greek apologists that people often refer to as the church fathers. We're talking Tertullian, Irenaeus, Origen, numbers of them. Okay, I'm not referring to that group. We'll get to them in a, in a different conversation. But the apostolic fathers, that would be the apostles of the Lamb, the 11, specifically, remember, Judas betrayed Jesus, another took his place, all right? God revealed, Jesus revealed himself to the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus and gave him a revelation of the, the message of the kingdom of God. Paul preached that message. He taught that message. He wrote letters of correction to the early churches, and he gave them the traditions, listen, the established practices and beliefs for the new covenant community. We refer to this as the apostles' doctrine. Stay with me. The apostles' doctrine. Okay. So, in Matthew 13, however, or 15, we, we find an interesting statement by Jesus. We're going to look at another type of tradition. And in Matthew chapter 15, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. Then came Jesus, scribes, then came to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees saying, why do your disciples transgress, watch, the tradition of the elders? And we're going to look at this body of teaching and practice known as the tradition of the elders. Jesus never got into conflict with the religious leaders of his day over the, the, the writings in the Hebrew scriptures, the Septuagint. He never got into a, a discussion. He never got into a problem about the law of Moses. He never got into any challenges about that because he never broke them. He came to fulfill the law, not do away with it. So, Jesus never got into, in, into debate with the religious leaders over the teachings of God, the teachings of the scriptures. All of the conflict that we read about in the New Testament has to do not with the law of Moses or the law of God, the Ten Commandments. It had to do with this thing called the tradition of the elders, and we need to understand what these traditions of the elders are. Now watch this, and how they came about. He says, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands. They don't wash their hands when they eat. And so Jesus answered and said to them, now watch this, why do you transgress the commandment of God for your tradition. Verse 7, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, this people, now this is a strong indictment against religious leaders. This is a very strong indictment against religious leaders. But he says, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, this people <laughs> draw near unto me with their mouth but and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. We can all give lip service 
to Jesus. We can all talk about how much we love God, how on fire for God we are, how how sent we are to defend the word of God. We can all give lip service. That's that's nothing new. But Jesus says <laughs> their heart is far from me. What Jesus is interested in is the condition of our heart. What Jesus is interested in is our love relationship, our covenantal faithfulness is what he's interested in. Not our lip service, not our intellectual presentation of truth. He's not interested in any of that, especially if what we're presenting is nothing more than the tradition of the elders. And what we're going to discover is that there's a large body of teaching today that is nothing more than the tradition of the elders. Y'all stay with me. This people, Jesus said, draw nigh me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What do they do? But in vain. Now, this is strong. But in vain, they worship me teaching for doctrine. Now, you got to get this. They are teaching for doctrine. The commandments of men. What are these doctrines? Doctrine is really teaching. Te doctrine are the principles of God. Doctrine are, 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 are the precepts of God. Doctrine is the body of instruction from Jesus that he gave. Now, Jesus is saying about these religious leaders, but in vain, they worship me. In other words, their worship ain't about nothing. I hear everything that they're saying, but their worship isn't about anything. Why? Because in vain, they are worshiping me, teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. What are they doing? They are teaching for doctrine the commandment of men. Now, remember, in verse 3, he said, Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So their traditions were not the teachings of God. They were the doctrines of men. They were instructions of men. And we're going to see how this is so prevalent. It is so very prevalent in the body of Christ today, and we can't figure out who to believe. We can't figure out what's right. We can't figure out whether God is one, is God two, is God three. You know, do we receive the Holy Spirit when we get saved? You know, well, if if a person, this, these are the kind of arguments that's floating around, and, and they've been floating around for a while. You, you know, is, is, is the Trinity true or is oneness true is is there is there one god who exists in three people or is there one god who reveals himself in three different manifestations you know and then everybody on on one side or the other is accusing the other of being a heretic this stuff is crazy <laughs> This, this stuff is crazy. And, and I have to wonder how many people have actually done the study, the research, the prayer to actually understand when you begin to call someone a heretic, that's a powerful charge. And if we are calling people heretics, false prophets, and false teachers because they have a view that is historically older than what we believe. This is kind of strange. Y'all stay with me. Now, hmm, this people. Now, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 6, what did he say? He says this. Thus, you have made the commandment of God of none effect by your Tradition, the only thing powerful enough to make the word of God, just the plain scriptures, the only thing powerful enough to, 
to make it of none effect are the traditions of men, the tradition of the elders. Now note who came to Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees. We're going to look at this group. We're going to look at that development. And then we're going to look at modern day scribes and Pharisees. Because God is setting his people free. Now, let me let me go on and let me read this same situation out of another gospel. Matthew, the writer, the gospel of Matthew, was written to the Jewish nation. It was written to Hebrews. It was written to Israelites. It was written to people who would understand exactly what he meant when he said the tradition of the elders. Mark on the other hand, is writing to a Gentile audience. So they're not real familiar with a lot of, of what people are talking about with these tradition of the elders. Mark is not really familiar with this, this thing or the people that he's speaking to. So he, he lays it out a little more fuller. So in Mark chapter 9... This is going to be interesting. Y'all stay with me. This is just this is just our launching pad here. In Mark chapter 9, he says this. Verse 7. Mark chapter 9. Actually, Mark chapter 7, I'm sorry. In Mark chapter 7, this is what Jesus says. And we'll start again at verse 1. And we'll, we'll skip. I'm not going to read them all, but. In Mark chapter 7, he says this, verse 1. Then came together unto him, unto Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees, which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eating bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees, now he's going to lay out, he's going to begin to give us some understanding of what the mindset of Israel's leadership was at the time Jesus was here during his earthly ministry. He's going to lay out exactly what the, the challenge was because what the challenge was actually was the word of God as opposed to the tradition of the elders. Is the word of God clear cut or do we need this other body of teaching, the tradition of the elders, to explain what God meant. That's the oldest trick in the book. Just go back to Genesis. God was clear. You can eat of every tree of the garden except the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, the tree of good and evil, you shall not eat. And the enemy immediately comes along and says, watch, hath God said. See, the enemy will always question the clarity you've got to get this the clarity of God's word the clarity of God's word but watch what the religious leaders did watch this now he said the Pharisees and all the Jews they only eat if they've washed their hands they do it often holding the tradition of the elders. Now remember, Paul said to the Corinthians, hold to the traditions. He said to those in Thessalonica, hold to the tradition. In this case, the religious leaders were actually holding to the tradition of the elders. So you can't hold two. You can't have two sources of authority. You can't have two sources of instruction. You can't hold one thing and receive something else. You've got to let go of what you're holding in order to receive truth. This was the issue with Jesus because they were so bent on holding to their tradition, they couldn't receive the word of God as it came forth from God manifested in the flesh. Stay with me. They only eat. So when they come from the marketplace, except they wash, they don't eat. And there's a whole lot of other things that they do, which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. <laughs> 
So the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why don't your disciples walk according to the tradition of the elders, but they eat bread with unwashed hands? See, they weren't questioning Jesus about his disciples when it comes to the commandments of God. They were questioning why the disciples didn't keep the tradition of the elders, because they're not the same thing. They're not. Now watch. So, again, Jesus said unto them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, This people, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. This is so rampant in the body of Christ today among most circles. So it doesn't matter if you consider yourself to be uh, evangelical. It doesn't matter if you consider yourself to be reformed. It doesn't matter if you consider yourself to be Pentecostal, to be charismatic, to be apostolic, to be prophetic, to be Greek Orthodox, to be Ethiopian Coptic, to be Roman Catholic. It doesn't matter what faith tradition you subscribe to. If you're simply keeping the tradition of the elders, your worship to God is in vain. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. See, scripture is very clear. Scripture is very easily understood. Now, when I say very easily, I'm talking about we do have to have the Spirit of God give us an understanding of the Scriptures. See, I still believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness so that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I still believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I believe that the Spirit moved upon men, as Peter tells us, and they wrote the Scriptures. So I believe that not only did the Holy Spirit guide the writing of the Scripture, but I also believe it takes the same Holy Spirit to give us an understanding of what was written. Does this make sense? So we can comb through, we can pour through theology books, we can comb through and pour through the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic, the Latin, we can do all of that. But the Father is so wise that he used people who were scholars, who were Greek scholars, who were, I'm not talking about took a couple of courses in Greek and know how to read a strong, exhaustive concordance. I'm not talking about that. I've been through seminary. I have my master's. I get it. I understand. But that's not what I'm talking about. Because you can do all of that and still not have an understanding, a clear understanding of what the scriptures actually teach. And many people know more of what their organization teaches, what their faith community teaches, what their denomination teaches, than they do what do the scriptures actually say. Stay with me. So he says, how be it in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men, laying aside the commandment of God. I don't even want to begin to talk about that. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little later. But they lay aside the commandment of God and they hold to the tradition of men things such as washing of pots and cups and many other such things they do. And he said unto them, full well, you reject the commandment of God so you can keep your tradition. Did you ever try to talk to somebody about something in the scripture that's pretty clear, pretty straightforward, not difficult to understand, but because of their religious tradition, they can't hear what you're saying? 
they're, they're, they are so bent in trying to prove their tradition, they can't hear the word of God. Or they try to impose their tradition on the word to make it say what they wanted to say because this is what they were taught. This is what was always believed. Well, the only way we can know what was always believed by the church, by the new covenant community, we have to go to the scriptures, not second and third generation Greek philosophers. And that's what most theology is. A lot of it. I love theology. But a lot of it is just philosophy of men. So he said unto them, full well do you reject the commandments of God. So you can keep your tradition. Verse 13 says, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition that you have delivered and many such things you do just like this. Isn't that interesting? Jesus's conflict in the New Testament did not involve the commandment of God. This is something that we need to understand. This will actually help you when you're reading your New Testament. It, it brings so many things into proper perspective because you realize Jesus, what, what they're battling over is not the commandment of God. It's the tradition of the elders. Now, y'all stay with me. The tradition of the elders was called a number of different things. The tradition of the elders was also known as the oral law. It was known as Pharisaic Judaism. It was also known as the laws of the fence and the hedge. So when we talk about mm, when we talk <laughs> when we talk about the tradition of the elders, we're not talking about stuff like you know the carpet or you know we have Bible study on Tuesday night and uh, this the where we always have Bible study, so that's when we do Bible study and th those are just conveniences to us because there's nowhere in the scripture that says you have to keep Bible study on Tuesday night. If, if, if it works for your community, great. But there's nothing in the scripture that deals with that. So when we talk about, or when I'm talking about tradition, I'm not talking about neutral tradition. I'm not talking about the fact, well, our church starts at 10 and we get out at 1.30. Or another church starts at 9. They have Sunday school until 10. Then they have a short break and then they start worship at 1030. And that's the way that they've always done it. Right? That's the way they do it. I'm not talking about those kinds of traditions. I'm talking about things that actually deal with what is your final authority when it comes to understanding the things of God. This is the aspect of the tradition of the elders I'm talking about. And it was known as the oral law. Some of you all may have heard about that. It was known as Pharisaic Judaism. It is also known as the laws of the fence and the hedge. Israel, to this day, Orthodox Israel, has a book that they refer to as the Talmud. The Talmud is a collection of two different sets of books, one being the Mishnah. We're going to look at this. The other being the Gemara, which is like commentary. It's commentary on the Mishnah. You know how we have Bible commentaries today? Bible commentaries are not inspired of God. They are aids to help us understand what the scripture is saying as far as that goes. But they're not inspired of God. They're not on an equal par. They're not of equal authority. They're not of equal weight. So, <laughs> They hold this to this day. Now, I want you to think about something. I want you to remember something. To understand where these traditions of the elders began, we have to go back to the time of Ezra. 
Old Testament. You will remember that Israel as a nation was carried away captive into Babylon. They were, as it were, destroyed as a nation, carried away, driven, scattered to the four winds. They were in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. Throughout their history as the people of God, there would be various cycles of discipline that would be used on the nation of Israel when it came to them honoring the covenant. The worst thing that could happen to them as a nation is that they go into captivity. And this is exactly what happened to Israel, the north, and Judah, the south. Judah went into captivity in Babylon. Israel was carried away captive into Assyria. So we're, we're really talking about a divided kingdom at this point. That's another teaching. But if they were to continually disobey the commandment, they would be carried away into captivity. The ultimate and final level of discipline would be captivity. Now, remember, that captivity in Babylon lasted about 70 years. You can read about this in the book of Daniel as well. When Israel was released from their Babylonian captivity under Cyrus and under Darius the Mede, the thing that was on their mind as they were going back to rebuild the city of Jerusalem was this. We know that we went into captivity because we disobeyed the covenant. We dif disobeyed the law of God. We disobeyed the Mosaic covenant. That was in their mind. They're, they're coming out of captivity. They're going back. They've got a lot of time to think about what they've done. So during the time of Ezra, they decided to educate everyone in the, now watch, in the 613 commands listed in the law of Moses to make sure that everybody understood what God expected out of them as a nation so that they wouldn't be carried away captive back into Babylon. So we're going to teach. You can read about this, actually. You can read about this and what took place in Nehemiah, you can read about it in the book of Ezra. That's what those books are all about, the rebuilding of Jerusalem. But they're centering and they're focusing on educating the people of God. So Ezra set up what became known as the school of the scribes. This is where the scribes originate. So if you if if, if you're ever reading the New Testament and you read the scribes and the Pharisees or certain scribes, this is who the scribes were, okay? They were set up under Ezra and they began to teach the word of God. Now, that's a good thing. Whenever people begin to teach the word of God, whenever people begin to emphasize the word of God, that's a good thing. And it's typically always a sign that God is working reformation because what is at the center of reformation is not tongues. What's at the center of reformation of signs, wonders, and miracles, or, or the center of reformation is not signs, wonders, and miracles, was at the center of all true reformation is the word of the Lord. Signs, wonders, and miracles confirm the word. That's what they do. If there's no word and there's a lot of signs, wonders, and miracles, they're lying signs, wonders, and miracles. Scripture is clear about that. So these scribes, their actual name that they would go by was the Supreme, the S O P H. E-R-I-M, the supreme, and their function, now this is where it gets interesting, was to teach the 613 Mosaic laws in such a way that the people actually understood the word of God. That's a good thing. So in order to understand the word of God, you have to be taught the word of God. 
you can't teach if you haven't been taught. Does that make a degree of sense? You cannot teach if you have not been taught. So here we go. He starts raising up Bible teachers because he wanted people to understand. Here's the problem with church history. Here's the problem throughout history. This is what you will discover. Whenever someone is raised up or a group of people are raised up during a time of reformation, such as John Wesley, Martin Luther, Calvin, I've mentioned a couple of these people, John G. Lake and many others. Whenever people are raised up with a word that is bringing people back to the clear utterances of the scripture, as the second and third generation of people begin to come in, it tends to get corrupted. It tends to get perverted. So what began as a genuine move of God ends up being a monument to somebody. This is where denominationalism comes from. You can trace every denomination to someone God was raising up to restore certain truths of his word. However, as generations pass, the emphasis becomes maintaining the monument to the man and oftentimes what the man actually taught is lost in other people's interpretation of what they thought he taught. Does this make sense? This is why the Word of Faith movement takes so much heat today. It's, it's not because people have gone back and, and looked at individuals who were used by God when it comes to restoring an understanding of faith in the body of Christ. And I'm not talking about your 1970s, 80s Word of Faith teachers. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the individuals going back into the 18 and the 1700s when God was teaching his people how to live by faith, how to believe God, how to expect God to confirm and honor his word. I'm talking about that group. It's the later generations that have gotten way off base with what the original intent of faith is. And they've turned faith into a means of, of really of, of capitalistic gain, especially in America. So faith is connected to money. Faith is connected to promotion. Faith is connected to a house. Faith is connected to getting a husband. No, faith should be directed toward us accepting and believing that God has and God will continue to confirm his word. And so all of these different movements, by the time you get to the second or third generation, you have a body of teaching that is distinctly different from what was actually given in the word that God led individuals to recover and restore that truth. Look at what has happened to Martin Luther's movement. It's the Lutheran Church. All right, stay with me now. No, no slight to Martin Luther because God used Martin Luther to restore back to the body of Christ. The just shall live by faith. We are saved by grace through faith alone. Scripture alone is our final authority. Not the teachings necessarily of the church is the teaching of the scriptures that we've been given by the hand of the apostles under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God's word is still true. Okay, let's keep going. So these individuals, after the time of Ezra, you had the supreme. Now, this is what they did. Since they didn't want to go back into captivity again, they say this. Well, we know that this is what the law says. So is it possible that we can come up with secondary rules? 
Stay with me. Secondary rules that we can build around these laws which will stop people short from breaking the commandment of God. Y'all stay with me. This is how this stuff got developed. Can we come up with secondary laws? And we're going to look at a couple that they did this to. Can we come up with secondary laws that it's okay if the people break these laws because it'll stop them short from breaking the law of God? Because, of course, we don't want to go <laughs> into captivity again. So it's not enough just to teach the word. We've got to come up with secondary laws. Remember this. As soon as somebody says that reading and expounding the scripture is not enough, you should have warning lights going off. The body of Christ is flooded today with people who have this kind of mentality and attitude towards the scriptures. So it's not enough just to read the scripture and allow the Holy Spirit to give you an illumination of what's in the scripture because people want a revelation. They want a download. You know, God, God spoke to me today and what God told me is X, Y, and Z. I'm fine with that. I believe that God communicates with his children. But I believe that we have to check any so-called revelation that we receive, we need to check to make sure it lines up with the ins inspiration of the scripture. Because any revelation that violates the inspiration of the scripture is not a revelation. At least it's not a revelation from Jesus. If the revelation contradicts the inspired text is not a revelation not from jesus warning bells should start going off so here's what ends up happening they come up with these secondary laws they acknowledge the law of god contained in the commandments are the the word of God, that which must be obeyed. So they're going to build a hedge around those laws. Because if we surround the law with these secondary laws, this is going to open up the New Testament for you. With these secondary laws, the people might end up breaking the secondary law, but they won't break the law of God. What was their point? We're going to build a fence. These secondary laws are going to stop people short of breaking the word of God. Let me give you an analogy. Think about an aircraft carrier. An aircraft is going to land on an aircraft carrier. Ordinarily, a jet needs a pretty long runway to land. They don't have that on an aircraft carrier. So what do they do? They attach a net to the back of the aircraft carrier. There's straps that come up. There's hooks that comes up that actually attaches to the plane and slows the plane down and stops the plane from running off the front of the aircraft carrier. That's what these laws were designed to do. Good thing as far as that goes in, in a pretty legalistic way. Same thing speed bumps do. We all are familiar with speed bumps on our streets. You're going down the street, there's a speed bump. That speed bump, you have to slow down or you're going to tear your car up. <laughs> so you want to slow down. This is what these secondary laws of the Supreme were, desi were designed to do. But this is what they did. They introduced something called pill pal logic. You can look this up. P-I-A-P-I-L-P-A-L. -P -P it's pill pal logic. Now, this is how pill pal logic work. It's incisive and it's sharp. So what they wanted to do with this pill pal logic. I know some people say, man, this stuff is boring. 
But I'm trying to give you the foundation so you can understand what the scribes and the Pharisees were about in the days of Jesus. Because when you understand what they were about, it will help you to understand how Jesus dealt with them. More importantly, since the enemy has no new strategies, you're also going to see exactly what has happened to the new covenant community, especially in our day to day, because we're dealing with the same thing and it was derived the same way. Logic. Now watch. So they have pill pal logic. So we want to see how many secondary laws we can arrive at from each of the 613 Mosaic laws. Let me say that again. What pill pal logic is going to do, they're going to see how many secondary laws that they can construct around each of the 613 laws contained in the law of Moses. Reason and logic. We're going to make a hedge around the law. So let me give you an example of one of these laws, and you're going to see how it happened. In the book, let me make sure I have the right chapter here. In the book, yes, of Exodus chapter 23, it says this. Exodus chapter 23. Here's what it says. You don't, you don't, you don't have to turn there. You, you, you'll find it later. Do not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Isn't that interesting? Do not boil a kid in its mother's milk. What on earth is that about? Now, <laughs> remember, as Israel was traveling to the promised land, they were coming into contact with all of these other pagan nations. They were coming in contact with the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, all of these other pagan nations who were involved in all kind of ritualistic religion. It's amazing. Man has always been religious. Man has always sought to try to figure out where to find God. The difference with the faith of Jesus is this. It's not about us seeking God in that sense. It's about the fact that God came seeking us. That's, that's really the difference. When you think about the difference between uh, being a follower of Jesus and just being religious. Religion is all about what you can do to please God or what you can do to find God. What you can do to believe everything right, you know, jot the I's and the tittles, right? Because you think that your intellectual acceptance of certain principles, whether they are the tradition of the elders or the commandments of God, you think that simply because you give lip service to it, but your heart's not in it, so you're not willing and obedient, in other words. This is what Israel is dealing with. So they're going through this wilderness and they're, they're seeing all this stuff happening. Now, the Canaanites had this practice. <laughs> it's really a fertility, right? You know, most of the laws of Moses are designed to prevent the people of God from even appearing like they're doing something that these other nations are doing. So the father doesn't want his worship confused with this pagan stuff that's going on out here in the world. So when, when he gives them laws, when he gives them instructions, when he gives them statutes, he's not giving them to them to try to put a heavy burden on the people. He's giving this to them so that their worship is distinctive from. So 
the Canaanites had this really weird ritual where they would boil a kid in its mother's milk, a baby goat in its mother's milk, and then they would sprinkle it over the field. And this is what they believed brought the blessing of the gods on their harvest. Let me say it again. There was a Canaanite ritual <laughs> where they would boil the kid in its mother's milk. Okay? Boiling a kid, a baby goat, in its mother's milk. Right? And then taking it, the milk, and sprinkling it over their fields. This is what they believe would bring the blessing of God on their harvest. This was a, a well-known practice. So God says to Israel, don't boil a kid in his mother's milk. He's obviously not talking about going and getting a big pot, <laughs> get a bunch of milk from, from, from a female cow or female goat, and then take her baby and put it in the milk and boil it. This is not what they're talking about. This is a religious ritual. It's a practice. But watch what pill pal logic does to this. <laughs> Don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. Here is their logic. <laughs> and well, you know, in the normal course, in just the average day, there's we're going to eat some goat. Just in the, in the normal course of a day, we're going to eat some goat, and we are also going to eat some goat's milk. We're going to drink some goat's milk. So we're going to eat some goat. We're going to drink some goat milk. Well, it's possible. It's not guaranteed. and We can't say it will happen, but there is the possibility that you sit down and you eat some goat and you have a nice cup of milk <laughs> in a normal day. Well, if the milk that you are drinking is from the mother of the goat that you're eating. The milk and the goat meat is going to go down into your digestive system. Your digestive system is going to heat up and it's going to draw out of the goat and the milk, it's nutrients. That's how our digestive system works, the acid buildup, right? Well, if the milk is from the mother of the goat that you're eating, you have just boiled a kid in its mother's milk. The acids in your body heating up because you ate them at the same time. This is pill pal logic. This is how they came up with all of this stuff in the Mishnah. Y'all stay with me. Y'all stay with me. And so if you do that, we're going to be carried away into captivity again. So what they did is they introduced laws of the separation of milk or meat and dairy product. Don't take my word for it. Just go read any orthodox literature. You know, check it in your copy of the Talmud. You'll see it in your Talmud. Don't take my word for it. But do some research. And this is actually what Israel, orthodox Israel, does to this day. They separate meat and dairy products. You don't eat meat and dairy in the same time span. You have to have enough time for whatever you had first to be uh, uh, entirely released from your system. So you don't eat meat and dairy at the same time. Why? Because the law says you shall not boil a kid 
<laughs> in his mother's milk. Now, what they're saying has absolutely nothing to do with what the commandment and the law, the principle, the precept, the statute, what it's actually dealing with. It's dealing with not appearing that your worship to the true God resembles anything that is of this Canaanite practice. Don't, don't do that. That's not going to bring the blessing on your harvest. What's going to bring the blessing on your harvest is going to be your obedience to the covenant. You see what's going on here? Okay. So these are fence laws. These are hedge laws. Separation of milk and dairy products. And this is where it came from. But it could go a little further because you could fall into the trap another way. Here's how you could do it. <laughs> As they're going through the wilderness, they may have had a plate. Just one, a plate. So they'd eat their dinner, wash the plate, possibly at night, come back, I'm just saying, eat some cheese or whatever, and then wash it again. Next day, same process. Wash the plate, then you eat. Wash the plate, and you eat. But here's what the Supreme said. There could be a problem. <laughs> because you could end up with a lump or a piece of cheese stuck on the plate. You might decide to have some cheese that night, and you have a little bit of cheese stuck on the plate. You wash it, but there's still a little possibility. It's not guaranteed, but there's a possibility. There's going to be a little bit of cheese on the plate. Stay with me now. I'm going somewhere. Well, what happens if the next day you wake up in the morning, you take that same plate, and you decide to have some goat for breakfast? You know, goat and eggs or something, goat waffles or something, right? But unbeknown to you, there's a speck of cheese that's on the plate. Well, there is the possibility. <laughs> it's not guaranteed. But there is the possibility that that piece of cheese came from the mother of the goat that you're eating the next morning. So what happens? The milk, cheese, product, dairy, and the meat go down through your digestive system. Your digestive system heats them up. You've just boiled a kid in his mother's milk. This is, this is really stuff that they came up with. Now, this stuff sounds crazy to us, doesn't it? Sounds crazy, right? But this is how they came up with this stuff that we read about in Mark. They, you know, they wash their cups. They wash this. They, they have this law. They got to wash their hands. They have to do this. They got to do the other thing. They got to do the other thing. These are the traditions of the elders. This is what was introduced in Israel starting back with Ezra. But Something happened. Y'all stay with me. Something happened. They're adding all of these laws. Remember, they're doing this to all 613. So they have to find out how many ways. So we've got the separation of milk and, and, and meat product. We got the separation of cups. We got, we got all of these washings that have to happen. We have all of this stuff that you've got to do. This is the tradition of the elders we're talking about. This is the New Testament conflict. This is it. Now watch this. 